Okay, so here goes our sound test. Um, would my deacons in Zoom just tell me verbally, can you hear this all right? Yes. Great. So welcome to Jackson Community Church. As everyone who is here in the sanctuary can tell, we are continuing with the hybrid experience and we believe this will be an ongoing part of our life as a church. Many of our cherished members were attendees of this church, tune in from different parts of the country and will continue to be part of our worship experience. So even as more people come back into the sanctuary, others will continue to join us through Zoom. So we will, we, we've advanced in technology and um, graduated to a different way of being a church. Uh, just a few announcements for the life of the church. We've rescheduled the council meeting from this Wednesday to the following Wednesday. So for anybody that would normally be attending council meeting, we'll send out the date, I think it's the 23rd, and it'll be at seven o'clock Wednesday, June 23rd, because both of our church officers had other commitments the week before, and we want them to be able to attend and lead us. We have the pleasure of Bob Carper being our interviewee next Sunday as we reflect on Father's Day in worship. There is an upcoming golf tournament. It's on Tuesday, June 29th, and it is a fundraiser for the music program of the church. And it was organized largely by our choir director, Billy, with the support of the choir. We're mostly at this point, I believe, looking for foursomes to sign up on that day. And for the cost of your playing, you'll get a t-shirt and a meal, as well as your round of golf. So please do keep watching. We sent out ver via the newsletter the sign-up sheet for that. And we would love to have lots of enthusiastic golfers come spend a day at the Wentworth enjoying a round of golf and helping with our music program. And finally, two, two Sundays, the last Sunday of June and July 4th, these will be services run entirely by our deacons. I'm going to be on a road trip with my daughter to visit my family in the Midwest. So um, the deacons are courageously completely diving into running hybrid worship on at the end of June. And then uh, our 4th of July service will be only on Zoom. Um, Alan will also be away 4th of July, as will I. So given that, yeah, we just decided the simplest way is the best way this year. So we have a great reflection. The deacons will be leading it. So there will be worship, but it will be a Zoom-based worship on that day. Those are my announcements for the life of the church. Are there any that I have missed out in Zoom land? Is anybody raising a hand or need to say anything that I forgot? Okay. With that, then I ask you to gather yourselves and Alan will offer us some music with which to center ourselves. So please relax. Put your feet on the floor or the ground and the earth if you're outside. Rest your hands in your lap. Close your eyes if you'd like. And simply come into this gathering and prepare for the presence of God in your lives.
We should also acknowledge that many of our families this morning are celebrating commencement with Tenet High School. Last year, for the first time, in order for our high school seniors to graduate, they couldn't gather, and so they creatively, as a community, came up with the idea of taking the chairlift to the top of Cranmore Mountain with their families, receiving their diplomas, and they wore their robes up and their tassels and all their regalia, and they were safe, and there was this amazing summit experience in their lives. And because it was such an exceptional form of a ceremony, it has been repeated again this year, and so this morning, our young people are literally going up a mountain to peak experience in their lives with their families. Yesterday, they gathered with friends, and they had a parade through town and other forms of celebration, but to acknowledge this threshold moment, we heard from our own senior, Caleb, last week talking about what lies ahead for him and what he's bringing with him out of his time growing up in this community. Let us hold these young people and their opportunities and their journeys in our hearts this morning. Please turn to the call to the worship that you will find either on your screen or in your bulletin. This comes from the scripture that we'll be reading later today, John 5. How long have you waited to be seen? Now one stops and asks, what do you want? How will you answer? reply by telling the one all the ways that others ignored you, stepped over and around you, and seized the chances that you hoped would change your life or another's life. Will you acknowledge that even if you could have cured yourself or rescued yourself, you didn't know how? How long have you waited to be seen, to be asked what you want, to be offered what you need? Wherever love finds you and me, it becomes a place of holiness, healing, and hope. Lastly, the one reminds us, don't miss the mark. Turn your gaze to the heart of the way you must aim your life, your being, your living. Aim, and if you miss at first, keep trying. Love will guide you toward the mark, help you on the way. We will continue to meditate on this passage and some of its meanings for us throughout this service. Right now, we gather and pray together. We start by praying out loud for our concerns and our celebrations. And so this morning, I ask if there are any prayers inside Zoom. And would Jeanette and Sandy let me know if there's anybody who would like to speak? Unmute yourself if you wish to share a prayer with us. Oh, wait, Meg. Meg does. Okay, go for it, Meg. Um, I would like us to remember in our prayers, Jean, who is returning to work part-time after her severe encephalitis this spring. Um, she's hoping to go back to work full-time soon, but this week she'll start part-time, and that's a huge transition for her. So let's keep this, her in our prayers, please. Thank you for, for reminding us of her ongoing journey in our prayers. We have been holding Jean in our prayers for several months as she went through this incredibly life-threatening challenge of encephalitis. Other prayers 
in our virtual community. I think that's it. All right, then we will welcome prayers from here in the sanctuary. Alan's grabbing us a microphone to get us started. But Kevin, go ahead and I'll, I'll translate. <laughs> it's like Kevin wants. So we're gonna we're carrying the microphone to Kevin. Give him one second, Kevin. Hello. Yes. Uh, prayer for Reverend Gail and Chris and the first responders and all the members of our church and all the visitors. And prayer that God will forgive me for what I did not know. So prayers for forgiveness and prayers of intervention for those that help support our safety and our lives in the regular course of a week. Other prayers here in the sanctuary. Alan will bring you the microphone if you wish to share anything out loud. You guys have been awfully shy the last few weeks. Let me name a few people that we wish to continue to hold in prayer. John, Judy and Bill, Deanna, Scamp, Huntley, Barry and Jan, Sasha, Mary, Donna. We have many, many people that we don't necessarily name specifically, but who are also in need of our prayers. Kevin, right? Kevin always wants our prayers and we need to give him our prayers. These are prayers for healing, for comfort, for renewal. We invite now any prayers of celebration that you have, and we'll start in the sanctuary and work our way back to Zoom. Go ahead, Kevin. Um, I'm grateful for Jeanette. She helped me, and all the people who helped me in our church and that care about me. And um, I'm grateful for the butterflies, the sunshine, and the birds. That's a pretty good list. Hard to top. Alan's got one. Um, uh, you may have heard from, a, I've said it before, but our new pastor at Our Lady of the Mountains uh, is going to be starting Father's Day weekend, uh, Father Josh Livingston. So we're very excited about that. It's been nine months that we've been waiting, so very excited. So for a new clergy member here in the Valley, Father Josh Livingston, we welcome him wholeheartedly, and we are grateful that he, he will be here to lead and support a very large and vital community of faith here in the valley. And we have another prayer. Go ahead, Sue. I had to stop my car on Glen Ledge yesterday due to a doe and her two fawns slowly crossing the street. So we all just stopped and let her go. <laughs> but also this morning, it's absolutely exhilarating to watch the beautiful red cardinals they are just something else to watch. What a gift. For the vibrant life around us that is revealing itself. Other prayers of celebration here in the sanctuary. Cheryl has one for us. Um, I, I hope I have this right. Um, I wanted to celebrate Ray and Arden. I believe it's their anniversary today. Ah. I, I hope I have that right. Ray and Arden's anniversary. And we know that Richard just had a birthday, so we think we should acknowledge his birthday. There are many birthdays, but the Augustines are with us again this week. They came up to celebrate his birthday here in the Valley, and congratulations on another great year among us, and we are glad you chose us to celebrate it with. Well, it looks like it's quieting down here in the sanctuary. Anybody else have a prayer of celebration you wish to share or gratitude? Then please, if there's anyone in Zoom who wishes us to lift up anything in celebration or gratitude, please go ahead and unmute and share.
Sandy and Jeanette are checking it out to see if they. Uh, think I think it. we're we're good. Everybody's so happy they're quiet. They're so happy they're quiet. Well, that's because all the noise is on the top of Cranmore <laughs> Mountain right now. I think we're we're the quiet part of the valley right now. Then please join me in prayer. And as we have been so often praying over the body of Christ, if there's a part of your body that you wish to place your hand on in order to pray specifically for healing or renewal of that part of your body or someone else's body, feel free to go ahead and hold that part of Christ's being in your palms. Oh, holy God, you are the creator who gathers us together, who calls us to healing, who calls us to wholeness in whatever way that may mean. It may mean our minds or our hearts. It may mean our bodies. It may mean our relationships. Sometimes painfully, it is returning home to that place from which we first came, a return to the love that encompasses all. You are the God who created this entire world in which we live that has been placed into our care. And yours is the love that through the people, your children, your sons and your daughters, you touch with tenderness and compassion, seeking justice and mercy and peace. When we touch each other's bodies, when we pray over each other's lives, we are praying in fullness for the life of our community, the life of our sister and partner churches, for places all over the world that require the presence and the love of this holy and loving God. We think always of the Chikanga Church in the city of Mutare in the nation of Zimbabwe. We think of the communities in Honduras. We think of the places where our children are graduating, have been stationed because they serve, have gone to attend school or to work for the summer, where people have gone to enjoy themselves and find a new way to live where people have chosen to serve. Our world is large, but we are bound together by your love and by how we live together on this planet, in this world. And so when we pray over the bodies gathered here where we can see each other or in our homes, we are praying for the great, the broken open body of Christ that is all of us. And we, your children, pray out loud together. And I ask that those in Zoom will please unmute as we turn to the words that you gave us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, heart in heaven hallowed, be thy, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, be done. on earth as it is in heaven. Give us we forgive those who sin against us. Not in temptation. Deliver us from evil. We have two readings this morning. One is scripture, and then we're going to line it up next to a parable that will elucidate the meaning of the word sin for us, because sin shows up in this story, and it's a problematic word for a lot of people. And I want us to think about what it means to be healed in different ways in our lives, and what it is we're aiming for, so that we may be whole in our relationship and our connection to God's self, ourselves, and each other. We turn first to the scripture, which you'll find either on your screen or on the back of your bulletin. This is a reading from John 5, verses 1 through 15. I want to note that there's some text in italics. This text does not appear in all translations because it was actually taken from margin notes in later translations of the Bible and carried forward through time and then removed again in more uh, integrated 
translations that go back to the earliest texts. And so in many translations, the text jumps from verse three to verse five and skips verse four because verse four is somebody's margin note that got carried into the Bible. But it helps us understand a little bit what people were thinking about. So we've included it here for your interest in education. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. After this, there was a festival of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate, there's a pool called in Hebrew, Bethzatha. We may also know it as Bethesda, which has five porticos. In these lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he or she had. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, stand up, take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was the Sabbath, so the Judeans said to the man who had been cured, it's the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made me well said to me, take up your mat and walk. And they asked him, who is the man? who said to you, take it up and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you've been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Judeans that it was Jesus who had made him well. So ends the reading. Think about a couple of things as I tell you this next story, which you can find either, we'll move it to the screen or you will can find it as an insert in your bulletin. How many times did Jesus find that man and seek to heal him? Had anyone ever seen that man before? What was the question that Jesus first asked him? And how did he reply? Listen now to this parable called Missing the Mark, which is a way of understanding the Hebrew and Greek word for sin that comes from an archery term that means to miss the target. The great king called his first lieutenant and he said, the strength of my army is in the archers. Go into the ranks and find those who do not know the bow and the arrow and teach them that my army may be strong in defense of my enemies. On the new moon, I will hold a contest to see your progress. I'm gonna paraphrase this for you at this point. The Lieutenant was not enthusiastic about this task. Okay, so he looks around and he fives, finds 20 people that he knows don't know how to shoot a bow and an arrow. He calls them out, he gives them their equipment, he sets up a target. He demonstrates. He holds his bow. And remember, this man has been trained to do this for his whole life. And for him, it's as natural as breathing. He can draw, aim, hold his breath, release, and every single arrow will hit the center of the target. And as soon as the men that he called out of the army start to practice, he starts chiding them and chastising them. Don't waste the arrowheads. Don't break that bow. Aim better. You missed. Chastising, punishing. He tells them all the ways that if they don't follow the rules, 
if they don't do it right, they'll waste the equipment, they'll waste resources, they'll waste his time. And by the time the moon comes around and the contest arrives, the king asks him to show what they can do. He says, shoot at the target and do not miss. And they miss over and over. Those 20 men miss. And when the king asks the lieutenant why this happened, he says, do you know how hard it is to sharpen and true an arrowhead? And then he says to the king, you know, these guys, they're lazy and incompetent. They're not fit for this noble task. I tried, but it's of no use. They continually do as I told them not to do. He blames it on the people that he pulled out of the army that he was supposed to teach. But the king knows better. And he's angered by the waste of these men's time and a month and his trust in this officer who does not know how to motivate or teach or serve. And he dismisses the lieutenant and instead he turns to his son and again, he says, the strength of my army is in the archers. Go into the ranks and find those who do not know the bow and the arrow, that my army may be strong to defend against my enemies. And on the new moon, I will hold a contest to see your progress. And here's how the sun approaches the same task. He found 20 common soldiers and commanded them to appear before him. He said, do you see the target before you? They all nod. He too had been an archer for all of his life. And he knew how to be one with his bow. And he too aimed the arrow tip at the target. And he held his bow and he held his breath and he looked past and above where it should fly and he released and every time the arrow flew true. And as they struggled, each with the equipment, trying again and again, he praised them and he was patient with them. Concentrate on the heart. Never lose this focus. You will lose fletchings. You will break shafts. You will dull the points of the arrows, but focus on the heart. The heart was the target at which they were aiming. Day by day, the soldiers that he was teaching inched their way forward, concentrating on the painted red hearts. And with every failure, the sun patiently offered instruction, teaching correction on their techniques. When a soldier would become lazy or unfocused, he would rebuke them carefully, bringing them back to the focus on the heart. And on the day of the new moon, when the king asked them all to demonstrate their skill, most of the archers hit the target. A few missed, but each, each one was encouraged by the sun. And he would say their learnings as I had to learn. And the father would nod and smile. And when a man failed, the king noticed that his son was silent. And the king asked how the son had taught. And the son said, as you taught me with great patience, grace, and a singular focus on the heart, so I have taught. There was one man who was the best at shooting, but he didn't, he didn't have integrity in the way he did it. And the king was silent. And he wondered about that man. And the son said, he will not turn his bow in the direction that it should go. He will not serve you. And the king asked that that man be taken out of the army. But for all the others, whether they had perfect aim or not, they were placed with those that already served him. And they became part of his work in the world. A contemporary person wrote this parable, and I offer it to us in conjunction with the story of the man at the pool because I asked you earlier, how many times did visit Jesus visit the man? Twice. First, among an entire crowd of people that had illnesses, 
he noticed and paid attention to this man by the pool. And the first thing he did was ask, do you want to be well? What is the aim of your heart? Do you want to be renewed, restored to connection? Do you want your life to have meaning and purpose? And the man gave him all the reasons why he couldn't get to that place where he thought he would find healing. And that he'd waited 38 years. Now, when we talked about this scripture on Friday, people were frustrated with that guy. How in the heck did he sit there for 38 years and never manage to get into the water? I mean, couldn't somebody have just like rolled him in? Couldn't he have like dragged himself? How is it possible that he was stepped over and around for that long? And how is it possible that all those people didn't see him, didn't support him or help him and let him lay there in his need, powerless and helpless and disconnected? Jesus saw him and asked him, do you wish to be made well? And even though the man gave this rambling answer, it was all about why he couldn't be helped. Jesus helped him. We don't know if the man was entirely powerless. We don't know what about his life made it so hard for him to be restored. But Jesus gave him back part of his wholeness. When he told him, get up, carry your mat and walk out of here. Now, we know there, there were people that were enforcing the rules of the Sabbath. Think of them as the lieutenant in the story about the archer. They're the people that chastise you and tell you you're doing it wrong. You're wasting my time. You don't understand how to value and use these resources. And if you don't do it like this, you're going to get it wrong. You're going to miss every time. And guess what happens? People miss every time. This man who'd been lame for 38 years walks out of the pool by Bethesda. And what do they see? They don't see his legs. They don't even know who he is. They've never noticed him, not in four decades. And now he's a walking miracle. And the only thing they have to say to him is, you should not be carrying that mat on the Sabbath. That's the only thing they see. They miss the mark. More than that, they want to find out who was working on the Sabbath healing people. The guy doesn't know. But later, Jesus comes back to that same man that he had seen before. And this time, he says, look, you've been made well, at least in your body. But that's not enough. I can fix the technical parts of things. But you're still missing the mark. There's something still not aimed true about how you're about to go live your life. I mean, it's great you're here in the temple. At least they meet in the temple. The man is trying to aim his life at a place where there's integrity and wholeness, we hope. But the meaning of sin when Jesus said, do not sin anymore, is a question of how this man will aim his life. That is the question at the heart of the story. What are we aiming at? How are we using our lives? I mean, yeah, we're going to get it wrong. Sometimes we'll shoot too far. Sometimes we'll sh fall short. We'll go too high. We'll go too low. But if we show up and we try, that's what God hopes for us. And if we're a little off aim and there's somebody in our life who says, hey, try again. Oh, wait, do it this way. Wait, here's another arrow. Here's the resource you need. Um, look at the target slightly differently. If you do it this way or that way, perhaps you'll get closer to where it is you're aiming your life. It's not like we're supposed to do it by ourselves. There's a teacher usually somewhere in our lives who can help guide us and help us figure out where we should be aiming and how we do it. 
the greatest part of the healing of this story doesn't take place when the man stands up and walks away from the pool of water. It takes place when Jesus reminds him that it's not just the outward part of you. It's not just your flesh. It's how your heart beats. It's how your emotions and your mind move your body through the world. It's how you connect with other people. It's a lesson for the Judeans that missed the miracle walking among them. It's a lesson for all the people who stepped over and around that man for four decades and ignored his situation and never bothered to ask him the one question Jesus said, which is, do you wish to be made well? What do you need? And it's a lesson for the man who now has the power to move through the world. It's great to know how to move in the world, but how will you use that opportunity? How will you use that chance to make a difference? How will you now see someone as you were not seen? How will you reach for someone, towards someone, and help them get to that place that they need to be when others couldn't do it, wouldn't do it for you? How will you aim your life? It is in the aiming of your life that your own healing will happen. And no, always, you don't do it by yourself. You do it with others around you. You're part of the community that God has opened up and created. You are wanted. And where you aim yourself is towards love, always towards love. We have ways of asking ourselves, is this love? You may have your own vows or covenants. At the eight o'clock gathering this morning, people remembered a saying that is, is it true? Is it good? Is it necessary? A way to measure each word or action. Scouts, people in the military, people in service organizations like Kiwanis and Lions and Rotary. All of these different ethical organizations have different filters that help you think about whether this is the right thing to do or say. At the heart of every one of those ways of imagining how you will act and speak and live in the world is the aim at love that is reciprocal, that wants wholeness for all people, sustainability for all people, to aim at love in the way that Christ walked in the world and modeled it for us. Today you are seen, brothers and sisters. If you have never felt seen before, then look at each other now and know that you are seen. And what you need and where you must go, there are those who will help you who will walk with you, teach you if you need teaching, or learn from you if you have something to offer. And it will be how you move yourself through the world and how you aim that will make all the difference. Do you want to be made well? Thanks be to God. So we always remind everybody, your offering makes a difference. Every week, people faithfully send their contributions either in the mail or online, jxncc.org or in person. And for all those different ways that you have so faithfully kept up your promise, your commitment, your relationship to this church, we thank you. And we remind you that this week is another one of those weeks where we can use and we appreciate all that you offer to us.
And now we will have our hymn together. I'm going to ask that you sing behind your masks. Churches are beginning to migrate away from that, but until our council evaluates that, we, um, we will continue to sing behind masks. Please, if you're in the congregation here and you wish to stand and sing, you may. If standing's hard for you, then stay seated however you wish to sing. We're going, go ahead, sorry, three verses, go ahead. standing you can remain standing for the benediction and if you're at home enjoy Alan will play us out, but please go in peace.